Long gloves. We didn't have these gloves. No, those are really comfortable gloves. Again, and we've got uh, Jerry outfitted up with his Viper F-16 <laughs> patch with the goal of trying to get him out to Luke someday uh, in November to fly. We've got the uh, Air Combat Command. And on the other side, we've got uh, Thunderbird Pilot um, patch as well. That was uh, remnants from um, 1941 to 1945 when you were yeah. at Thunderbird Field. Yeah, well, there were two, two Thunderbird. We were at Thunderbird too, at, uh, which is now the Scottsdale Airport. And we were out in the country. And it was, it was the thrill of my lifetime to be able to learn how to fly and uh, go on to fly the best airplane that I think was ever built. A lot of people still feel that way. Well, here's what you eventually end up flying was a P-51, which a lot of people in my yeah, generation... Yeah, but this is carrying big bombs. Yeah, that's... We, we're we, going to call those wing tanks. They are wing tanks. And, and there's have, the other greatest uh, fighter that was ever built uh, in my generation was the uh, F-16. But, you know, a lot of design and, and with the bubble canopy um, was passed on from that generation to this generation, and you don't quite see it as well as in uh, the F-22 and F-35, I don't think. No. Uh, we were really the last stick and rotor pilots. And you guys have a lot of computers and automa automated things. Yeah, it's, it's we were hands-on for eight hours in a clip, hands-on, stick and throttle. Well, you and know, you, let, me, let me transition to your book, The Last Fighter Pilot. You know, you talked about automation and um, the, the F-35 and the F-22 will be around probably till 2050, 2060 and then I think the, the age of the fighter pilot is probably going to be gone, don't you think? Or Well, they're going to make cars that are self-driving and roads that maybe can help them out. I don't know what's going to be in the future. Uh, I know the Air Force is studying what they want to have and the manufacturers will start fooling around like that. But the airplanes today are all computerized. I mean, I, I sat in the cockpit of the F-22 in uh, Hickam Field, and they push a button, the instrument, engine engine, they push a button in the far, and they see missiles, and they have missiles and eight or ten put buttons that they can push on top of the stick or the throttle, and, and, and they can pick, uh, pick up a foreign airplane 20 miles away and never even see it and fire a missile and shoot it down. We had to fly up and... They're, they're we, weapons platforms is all they are. Yeah, right they're, right? they're just, yeah, they are weapons platforms. You can fill them up in the air with, with fuel. We couldn't do that. Uh, we had to keep the ball in the center when we were flying it. You have to have that ball in the center. Your bullets weren't going where, you were, where the target said that you wanted them to go. And so we were different kinds of fighter pilots because right. the airplanes, we, so these were... These today are like the antiques of World War One to us. The P-51 is an antique like the SPAD was an antique. Sure. And did, did fighter pilots in your air talk with their hands? I mean, when oh, we, we always talk with the hands. We always point towards the well, watch. We never, you know, I still talk with my hands when I talk flying. We come in and get on the wing, do loops. and mm -hmm. We only talk with the hands. Fighter pilots talk with their hands. The instructor talked with his hands. Exactly. Everything is with your hands. These are two airplanes. You spread apart, you feel mutual support. It's all with your hands. Right. We call that a shackle or a weave. And uh, Well, it's, a, it's, it's called a weave. There was a guy whose, na whose name was on the weave. Um, he was a Navy fighter pilot who figured it out what to do. And we did that so that the wingman could look back and and we had... 360 degree visibility. Mutual support. And Mutual I mean, support. Uh, that was another question I want to talk to you about is, I mean, the importance of having a wingman and the ability to allow the lead to be the flight lead and the wingman would take care of some of the admin things or the mutual support check and six. Well, they, they didn't do any of admin things. We didn't have any admin things, administration things, things you had to do. But we flew as an element of two, the wingman here, the wingman over here, and we crisscrossed an, as four. If you got split, we split the element into two, and we did two-man mutual support across the sky. That's the way we flew in combat. And if you broke, you broke towards a, a, an airplane, the guy came behind you and broke. If it was the element leader, the wingman was behind. If it was the wingman who did it, 
the element leader was behind. Right. We tried never ever to be alone in the sky, always with somebody else. We tried, it didn't always work because you broke off and did your own thing. Well, how, about, how about pulling G's? I mean, I, I know you weren't uh, doing a lot of air to ground stuff and a lot of the, the G loss of consciousness on the Stuka pilots was unknown to anybody. Did you guys even think about G's when you were pulling? We did think about G's, but the more important than G's, when you came from high altitude down at a fast speed, you blew your ears out. There was no pressurized combat, uh, no cockpit. pressurized cockpit. Right. And so you came from 15,000 out on 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet in a steep dive, going about 450 miles an hour. You had to scream, you had to try and clean your ears, blow your ears out while you were doing that because the, compress the compression at 15,000 feet, the compression at 5,000 feet were entirely different. And what about G's? Did you, th you we, think you lost anybody's three, the four, G no, no, no. I, we only worried about reading out, not blacking out. Uh, we pulled enough G's. You'd see the vision close yeah, down a little. Close bit. down, you, you felt it. Uh, I think we maybe pulled three, four G's if you went to five G's. Even the airplane, if it weren't coordinated, would pull itself apart. Mm -hmm. That There's happened twice. Structural limits on the airplane. Structural limitations on the airplane. I don't think that structural limitations are there today. I think that the pilot limitations are there. Exactly. That's the problem with the F-16 is pilots have difficulty pulling anything more than 9 Gs. The airplanes have limiters on them that allow them to pull 9 Gs but not ever stress the airplane. Wow. Right? So that's, wow. that's different, a, different technology. But the Gs are definitely a limit in uh, 9 Gs. I've lost several friends that G loss of consciousness, we call it G lock. Um, that I'm sure was starting with uh, the German Stuka pilots I read when they were doing their dive bombs. And yeah, well, that pulling out of their dive. But right. I flew an A24, which was a Navy dive, uh, the, the Navy dive bomber, and I pulled out. I didn't feel the G's as much as we did in the P 51 in the A24. Maybe I wasn't going as fast. But I was at Bellows Field with the P 51s, and Bob Downs was a uh, leading a 16 ship, 16 ship loop, 16 airplanes, wow. P-51, nose underneath the tail. And a sailor came up and tapped me on the shoulder. And he says, excuse me, Lieutenant, or Captain, excuse me, Captain, do you know um, uh, Bob Ferris? And I said, yes, I do. And he says, you know where he is? I said, absolutely, he's the 16 ship <laughs> in that aerobatic <laughs> loop. And as I said that, the 16th ship exploded. Oh no. Into little pieces coming down so the sun. Structural, you think? No, he was out of sync, going 400 miles an hour, and he pulled the wings off. Ugh. A few days later, uh, a McCain pilot, a guy who doesn't listen to anybody, John Lidner broke away from a dive and went down at 450 miles an hour and pulled up like that, and his wings came off because he pulled up uncoordinated. Huh. He pulled the wings off. Two airplanes, two guys killed. 